Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise in studying the evolution of lower card catfishes, which are also known as plecos or whiptail catfishes or otto sinkers, etc. within the creme trade. And today I am just going to talk about herbivorous fishes and why people are getting it so wrong. So often when we think of herbivores, most people are sort of thinking more about cows, horses, sheep, maybe it'd be rabbits, very terrestrial sort of sense of what herbivory is. And when it comes to aquatic ecosystems, it's entirely different. Firstly, terrestrial ecosystems are largely dominated when it comes to herbivory by plants, so sort of macrophytic or uh, very developed plants that are not very simple at all. Or maybe there's seeds, there's nuts, uh, there's also fruit. Uh, you could get ones that maybe eat a bit more fungi and stuff like that, but it's all very different from that freshwater ecosystem in what actually compared to the photosynthetic life there or the microbial life because it's not in the terrestrial sense you can be a bit more specific to feed on certain plants and kind of you're not really accidentally eating completely other taxa which aren't photosynthetic as much. So in aquatic ecosystems we're going to, thinking mostly about algae, protozoa, so protozoa is this sort of microbial sort of mix of different groups Algae is actually the same, it includes anything like cyanobacteria, which is actually a bacteria, it's totally um, not related. Also includes a lot of protozoa, and not all of them are closely related to plants, some are, not all are. But then we're also thinking in herbivory, maybe not entirely just about this photosynthetic life, outside of general protozoa that might be more... Uh, uh, sometimes predatory, sometimes feeding on other things, might be thinking about bacteria, also fungi but very different fungi, not being mushrooms, maybe more looking at hyphae and stuff like that which is the sort of the roots you could say of the uh, fungus itself. It might also be feeding on a whole load of different um, sort of small animals much smaller like actual true animals, whether it be, I think, rotifers count and uh, stuff like that. And there's different mechanisms when it comes for feeding, but we have to recognise it is entirely different to terrestrial life. And this is where people get make mistakes about understanding what their fishes might eat in the wild versus in captivity, because the sort of herbivorous diets are mostly based on what we think about terrestrial diets and especially when it comes to giving them a range of different ingredients we're thinking very much terrestrially rather than what would be a range for them and this also matches into it's important to recognize just because the morphology will differ so in the broad sense it matters because this morphology so this might be the shape of the gut the jaws the teeth also leading more into microbiology of the fish will differ where they might have uh, the gut biota, the gut bacteria, the archaea that might be more specialised to what they eat in the wild and it's a bit of an evolutionary jump to feed them something completely different. It also affects their accessibility, so how much of that nutrients is accessible to that species. So it's not really as simple as they're just adapt because it's no different from feeding a herbivore or carnivore diet and vice versa. It's quite a jump between the two. So zooming in now, we think it's worth thinking about what different herbivores there are in the aquatic ecosystem when it comes to fishes, um, because I'm not really going to talk too much about other groups. And I'm mostly focusing on lower cards because that's what I'm really interested in, but. This is a, so this is kind of um, these are all terrestrial sort of resources to kind of replicate it. So these are all found in a forest, and it's kind of an easier way to see what they're feeding on without having to get out the microscope or kind of explain completely different taxa and also trying to see it without stains because I don't actually have any stains. 
So when we think about herbivory, a lot of uh, freshwater ecosystems are supplied la la largely by autothanos um, nutrients. So these are, this would be light and then maybe, I guess there'd be some nutrients obviously from the, any rocks or stuff like that. Um, there will be some terrestrial input and this promotes a lot of particularly algae and photosynthetic life. So here I've got, to replicate that, I'm actually using moss. So moss does grow sometimes in aquatic ecosystems, but not really. It kind of doesn't grow that deep down, but there's loads of different algae and stuff. And this kind of replicates in a way because, so a moss will have not just the moss itself, but it's going to have loads of other organisms in between. And that's what the algae will do in freshwater ecosystems. It will not just be one species of algae, there will be bacteria and stuff like that. And this is kind of what feeds a lot of different fishes. And these fishes will be rasping on it most likely, or feeding in, sometimes they might be using stronger jaws to kind of scrape at it, but it's actually very different from if you think a terrestrial animal, such as a rabbit, a sheep or something like that, which is, they uh, have very different uh, jaw shapes, so they will be grabbing and pulling. And while moss looks lovely and fluffy and quite easy to pull, um, the algae actually isn't, it's best done with a scraping manner. So I've got a, a lovely cat brush here, and you can imagine these fishes are literally going in and pulling like that with these teeth. And that's what law carids do quite well. And that's why they're so effective. So it's kind of just tugging. If they were just pulling, you're not going to get as much off. But they're scraping at it. And while I'm showing Vox here, these algae protozoa, bacteria grow on a wide variety of surfaces in freshwater. So also you'll get it on wood, which isn't the easiest to brush because it's a bit coarse, but you can see all the different mosses here can replicate the kind of algae, bacteria, protozoa. So this is going to be what a lot of the basis of the ecosystems are based on. And there's a whole diversity of different algae. Some will be more difficult to get off than others. Some you could just, like, you can imagine some mosses, some are really tight to the rock and some are a little bit looser. Some take a bit more work and if you compare to, say, this bit of wood, you've got, um, instead of moss, some you, there's lichen here. That's going to be a little bit more to scra scrape off. So then you've got differences in teeth shape depending on what they're feeding on. So you've got some that might have less teeth. They may be going to be focusing on certain foods, maybe even invertebrates. But they're not going to be scraping probably the more difficult algae. You're going to have these finer teeth, just like a toothbrush almost. And some surfaces are more complex than others. So here we've got one that it might be really difficult. If you've got long, wide jaws, it's going to be great to get a lot of algae and stuff off a flat bit of rock, off a large flat bit of wood. But when you've got a complex structure like this, it's a lot more difficult. And that's where you have smaller jaws, maybe with wider t uh, more teeth than what you can imagine on the fork. And that's really a lot of what these ecosystems, a lot of the sort of basics, um, or the sort of the lower trophic levels are filled of a lot of grazers. And it's not just lower carbs, it's not just plecos. It can be uh, Balatoridae or Gastromyzonidae, which is the hill stream loaches, or you've got some Cynodontis uh, relatives, or even Cynodontis themselves that are doing this. And it's not just fishes, there will be some invertebrates, but fishes really contribute this a lot. And then we have some other diverse clay. So in Lower Cardae, we actually have some that because when you look at a surface like this, um, like any of these surfaces, there's probably not actually going to be uh, 
bacteria, protozoa, microbes just on the surface. But if you've got jaws shaped like this, you can't really gouge out much, can you? Um, so it makes it, they're not going to be feeding on, they're not going to be able to really scrape out the wood. So imagine this is a lot more like ancestrous, barium ancestrous, something like that. You can't really get into that wood at all. And therefore, we've also got some other clay. So I don't have um, really a great comparison for this because they're so unique. But some of the panac, the panaculus, they they've got spoon-shaped teeth, and this allows them to literally gouge at the wood. So literally, like that in a way. So they're able to get. And they're not feeding on the wood, but because of what, how wood is and how porous it is, if you get a rotting bit of wood, it's covered in fungi and bacteria, not just on the outside, but also on the inside. This gives them a selective advantage over those other species in the habitat that can only feed on a, sur a surface like this or a surface like this. They can only feed on the front. These ones can actually go inside as well doesn't mean they, ha they have to be able to, but they can. And this is kind of the diverse, so why laurel cards are probably so successful, is this diversification of different feeding niches and being able to feed on different surfaces and different algae, different protozoa, because some will be tighter to the surface, some will be looser, some will be easier to get, and therefore you get this insane diversification even in one place because they can feed on different things and in different places and hence that probably led to like um the ones that gouge in the woods are not too like some of them aren't too distantly related to some that have really specialized morphology to get into the cracks and crevices and that led to potentially some more carnivorous clades coming out because the jaw morphology doesn't differ, like the actual to be take out invertebrates from a sort of a crack or crevice isn't the, a massive jump from those sort of smaller jaws or fewer teeth. Although this is very much focusing on where herbivory evolves into carnivory. More than often it's the other way, it seems where you get very mostly carnivorous clades and there will be a few examples of some more generalist herbivores. But you might say there is other forms of uh, sort of plant photosynthetic life in the water and of course there is. So you've got leaf litter, it really depends where it is and you've got maybe um, seeds, maybe um, fruit and these require very different types of feeding um, anatomy. So these might be having, so low cars aren't very good at this in comparison because they're, so plecos, they are rasping, so they're, they're just doing that all the time. For something like this, you want to be able to grab the food item and pull or chew at it, which they can't really do that well. So that's where you get like paku, uh, silver dollars, and they're able to just chew at a food item. The other thing is that we're also very much focusing on one singular pair of jaws. And not all fishes have singular pairs of jaws. Many fishes have a double pair of jaws, so one for grabbing the food, so grabbing the food, and then another for chewing it, processing it further in. And that's what will be happening a lot with anything eating plants probably. But you also get invertebrates that will process it first. But it's very different morphology and a lot of people generalise herbivores as if they feed on this, they feed on this, and if they feed on this, they feed on that. Which isn't true. There's a whole diversity of what they feed on and what they're capable of feeding on. Particularly when it comes to seeds and hard food items. If you, you need particularly strong jaws and robust teeth to break into or feed on anything like seeds. You can't imagine something with very fine, numerous teeth being able to use those to crunch on a seed or something like that. Even in vertebrates they're going to struggle with some of them such as snails and mollusks. 
So that's when you get other morphology, such as very large, rounded teeth. Um, you might see in the sort of Paku. Um, but also some lower cards have this in the frangial jaws. Many cichlids have this, so they can just crunch that food item. In, um, so seeds or maybe mollusks in their jaws. So there's a wide diversity of different herbivores in, in the aquarium trade, in fishes in general, and they do feed differently and it's useful, important to actually recognise that. So hopefully this is kind of a different demonstration, something a bit more interesting to kind of explain why, so why fishes are feeding in the way they do. Why a panak or wood eating, um, a wood breaking into lower carid is actually feeding on this or I inside this or can feed in inside this to extract its food item over one that is going to be able to feed on this. And it doesn't mean they're actually, if they're scraping at the rock, they're not eating the rock. It's no different from where they're just gouging at this wood to try and get the food item. And then the plant eaters and stuff like that for more macrophytic plants. So anyway, uh, hopefully that's kind of useful and if people have any questions, I'm happy to answer. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe. And don't forget we do have a Discord server to discuss anything scientific or um, interesting in aquariums and stuff like that. Anyway, thank you for watching.